morning, New Hope. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're following together on this road as, as God takes his people from the place where they were to the promised land. We're following this story together. And, and we've been seeing how God has rescued them so far from slavery. He's brought them out of Egypt. He's rescued them. He's delivered them from slavery. And God is now ready to do something else. God is ready to lead them right to the promised land, but there is a problem. And that is, in front of them was the road, the road ahead. And it wouldn't be easy. They were going to Canaan, a land rich, flowing with milk and honey, green garden-like place. And in this place, God would build a nation out of Israel. A nation that was supposed to be a light to the world, to show them who he really is and how he deals with people. It would reveal his presence and his power and his plan. Not only for Israel, but for you and I, for all people. So that we can come back to him in a perfectly restored relationship, because that's what God wants. He would come down to soon to personally live with them. We saw that last week, didn't we? He wanted now to come down just as it was in the garden. He walked with them and talked with them. Now he wants to come down and personally live with them, abide with them. Because God desires a deep, personal, intimate relationship with us. His people, as we saw last week, would have to do three things. Three requirements would have to be met before God could come down and be with his people. His people would first have to live by a set of guidelines that he would reveal to them that would enable them to treat God and one another with love and dignity and respect. Secondly, they would have to build a special place where God's special presence could be and meet with them. Now, this was much more than just a tabernacle. It was much more than just what you and I would consider a place of worship. It was really, in its building, God's way of testing them. God's way of testing them. Are you faithful? And as the people built the building, God was building the people. And then thirdly, they would have to understand the price that needs to be paid for sin. How drastically separated they were from God. And so they, God would need to establish a sacrificial system that would point the way to their need for a savior, a way to bridge the gap between God's perfect holiness and their flawed selfishness. And all these rules and elaborate ceremonies that were developed in the Old Testament, all the sacrifices of animals were to demonstrate the price that it took to restore us to God. And of course, ultimately in Hebrews, we discover that all these animal sacrifices were only temporary. They could never actually forgive sins. They were only temporary to lead us until the coming of the perfect lamb, Jesus, who would ultimately actually take away our sins. Now, if you missed the, the previous messages, I encourage you to look at those because that will really bring you up to speed to where we are today. Now, thus far in the story, we've seen how God's people have been marvelously, have been marvelously taken care of marvelously provided for. Thus far in the story, we've seen how God's people have been marvelously delivered and directed. Delivered and directed. He delivered them from Egypt, and he was about to direct them further. You remember the story, don't you, of how they were delivered from Egypt? Exodus chapter 14, verse 21 and following says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. All night he made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and all the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea and all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen chased after them. And then in Exodus 14, 27, it says, so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh 
that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. That's God's deliverance. And now he was about to direct them. Our story continues one year after they were delivered. A little bit over a year. They were delivered from the Egyptians, and the road ahead, the road ahead, will take us in our text through Exodus and partway through Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy as we look at this story. God has delivered them from slavery, taking care of their every need, and now he is about to direct them through his servant Moses on their journey to the promised land. That was the road ahead for them. Now, thus far, they have camped in the exact same place for more than a year. But now Moses prepared to lead them to the new location. Moses must lead them across. In order to do this, he must lead them across the whole Sinai Peninsula, a barren wasteland onto a fertile land of Canaan. Now, at this time, by the way, scholars estimate that there are some, catch it, three million Israelites. Can you imagine leading three million people across the desert? Numbers chapter 10, verse 11 through 13 says this, In the second year, in the second month, on the twelfth day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran, and they set out for their for the first time at the command of the Lord by Moses. This was their first strike camp, get up, let's march. God instructed, by the way, to divide them into 12 different groups, 12 different tribes based on the name of each of the sons of Jacob or Israel, as he's now known. And each tribe was visually represented by gigantic, colorful banners held above them. You could just picture the scene in your mind. Three million people broken up into 12 different tribes. I don't know if you've ever taken a long road trip, especially with your family. But it always starts out so good. (laughs) Like most trip, like most road trips, this one started out doubtless with good spirits, high hopes, Everybody ready? Yes, I'm out of here. We've been here for a year. Let's go. And the good times lasted for about three days. Very, very quickly after they began their journey, the people rapidly became disappointed and disgruntled. Disappointed and disgruntled. You know how you get disappointed? Expectations... Minus reality equals disappointment. That's how you get disappointed real quick. The people got disappointed real quick. And it is interesting, the rapid contrast in our text is startling. Numbers chapter 10 paints this glorious picture of God's people gladly getting up, gladly obeying the order to march proudly with their banners in high spirits, high hopes of a bright future ahead. And the very next chapter, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Listen to the words. And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. you got to be kidding. Why? Why? Because ultimately... In the midst of their lower story circumstances, in the midst of the things that they can see about them and the challenges around them, they lost sight of what God was doing in the upper story because they're too busy focused on the here and now. In doing so, they forgot all that God had taken them through, all that he brought them through, all he delivered them from in the past. You know, you and I are like that often. We look at, I look at, my present circumstances sometimes, and I think, oh, woe is me, this is terrible. How horrible this is. I'm never going to get out of this. And I start whining and moaning and complaining to God, and I forget all of the things he's brought me through. These people just forgot. They forgot the upper story. They forgot all the things done 
God had done for them. And so because of that, they very quickly became disappointed and disgruntled. It's all about perspective. You know that? They started out, I don't know if you remember this, they started out, Israel did, with just 70 people. 70 people. Now they were 3 million. By now, God had greatly multiplied their numbers. He had blessed them in every way. He'd given them a strong leader to guide them, a strong foundation of principles on which to base their lives and to stand, an identity as a people, a purpose to exist, a glorious vision of the future, and a clear mission to accomplish. And on top of all that, he supplied them with everything that they would need in order to succeed at all of these things. He was even giving them their own land. But they couldn't see any of those things. They forgot all the past. They forgot all the blessings. All they could see now is it's too hot, and it's too dusty, and the road's too long, and we're too tired, and it's taking more time than we thought. And we don't have enough resources. It's like the kid in the back going, are we there yet? God's response, God's response to all of this, I'll give you a clue. He's not happy. He sends down fire that burned the outskirts of the camp. And the people saw it and were, whoo, shocked. That only lasted for a few minutes because you know how they responded? They then began, as if that weren't enough, complaining about the food that God had been providing for them in abundance. They not only complained about their diet and everything else, but it got so bad that they even started asking for the good old days, reminiscing about the good old days back when they were slaves in Egypt. Can you imagine that? Numbers chapter 11, verse 4b through 6. Oh, that we only had meat to eat, and we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt that cost us nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. It's like breakfast at my house growing up with my mom. And now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Isn't that crazy? God's response to their response? Not happy. Numbers chapter 11, verses 10, verse 10b, and the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses was their leader. He was displeased too. What's Moses' response? Numbers chapter 11, verse 11, and 14 through 15. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? I am not able to carry all these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, then kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. You see what he's saying there? The leader of all these people? What he's saying is, just kill me now. You know how many people, pastors and people involved in ministry, I've heard say similar things? Just kill me now. These people are killing me. See, the problem is you can take the people out of Egypt, but you can't take the Egypt out of the people. Expectations minus reality equals disappointment. When you're disappointed, it's easy to become disheartened and disgruntled. Now, slavery, make no mistake, was terrible. But it was their comfort zone. I mean, they were used to it. They just become comfortably numb. Why were the people this way? Why? Wouldn't that be a great thing to have an answer to? Why were they like this? Because, I mean, we read these things and we go, you're, you're, you guys are crazy. Why are you like that? Huh. Well, in case we start thinking too highly of ourselves, we have the same tendency too. Why are the people this way? Is it because of food? Is it because of diet? Is it because of, well, no. 
It's really not because of any of those things. Oh, those are the symptoms. The disease goes far, far deeper. You know what their problem really was? They wanted control. Control. They didn't want to have to be directed by some earthly leader. Who's this guy? What does he know? And they certainly didn't want to trust God with their diet. Their menu had to change. See, it ultimately comes down to pride. Control, the need for control, comes from fear and pride. Eventually, being disappointed and disgruntled eventually led them to also be distrusting and defiant. Distrusting and defiant. They were ready to receive what God had promised them. By this time, those incidents I read just earlier, there were many such incidents like that. Where they just kind of grumbled and complained, ignored what God said. But after a while, God, despite all their failures, had finally taken them to the place where they were just about to enter the land that he promised them. They were at the city of Kadesh Barnea, just south of where they were supposed to enter the promised land. And it was time to enter. It was time to enter. And so, Moses orders a pre-engagement recon. He gets 12 spies, one from each tribe. And he says, go check out the place. How best to take it? What's the best strategy? Forty days later, they return with their final report. What's the land like? Oh, gorgeous. The land's awesome. It's better than we thought. There's fruit and abundance everywhere, and everything's beautiful and green. Except we're dead set against going in. Why? Ten of them reported that taking the land might be hard work, and there were risks involved. The people were large. There were a lot of them. This could be hard work. This could be even risky. We don't like taking risks. Not surprisingly, with 10 of the 12 spies completely against going in, you know how people are. You start getting the gossip and the rumors and the murmurs and the whisperings and corners. And pretty soon, the, the murmurs of the doubt and the fear of the 10 grew like a cancer all over the people. Popular opinion spread, and the people's decision was made in their minds. We will not enter the land. We will not enter the land. Two of the 12 spies were all on board with God's plan to claim the land. But, you know, popular vote and all. Why did this happen? Why was this the case? See, this kind of thing happens when we take our eyes off of the upper story and start focusing on all of our obstacles in the lower story, because there's always obstacles. It's the, listen, it's the easiest thing in the world for someone to stand up and say, oh, yeah, but... Won't it be hard? Won't it be risky? When we start asking for popular vote to decide if moving forward with God's mission for us is prudent or convenient or affordable or necessary, we start getting in trouble. When we forget what God has already brought us through in the past, because that's how we are, right? We forget all the good things. We forget all the trouble he delivered us out of. We forget all of his faithfulness. And we start focusing on all the giants in our way. When our fear of giants is bigger than our fear of God, we fail. When we think that all of our obstacles are bigger than our God, we fail. What was the difference between, do you think, the ten spies and the two? What do you think this difference? Like, were the two smarter, or were the ten smarter, or like, were they more experienced? Were they, what, what was the difference? The difference between the ten spies and Joshua and Caleb, the two, who said they should take the land, 
is that they believed, the two spies believed that they could do it because God had proven his trustworthiness and faithfulness to them. Not because they thought they were strong enough or smart enough or rich enough or brave enough, because God. And they believed that something beyond themselves, listen, something beyond themselves should factor into the equation of how they made their decisions. Something beyond money, something beyond ability, something beyond skill, something beyond chance and circumstance should factor into that. What should factor into that equation? His power, his purpose, his promises. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30 through 32, but Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. You see that? That's not about us. What it's about is God. What it's about is his ability to overcome it through us, not our ability to overcome it. And look how the passage continues. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out. Isn't it funny how the naysayers almost always win? Almost always. It's all about fear and doubt. Not only did the people stubbornly refuse to obey... They even thought about getting rid of their leader, Moses. Now, we're done with this guy. I don't trust him anymore. He's just going crazy now. Let's get rid of him. He, he's, he's a little too, you know, farsighted. Let's get rid of this guy. Let's find someone who would take us back to Egypt, you know, back to the good old days. God's response to the people Numbers chapter 14, 11, and the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? Isn't that interesting that God interprets their unwillingness to follow him in faith as despising him? How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've done among them? You know what he's saying? He's saying, can't they remember what happened? Don't they remember how few of them there were and how I grew them in number and how I provided for them everything they needed and gave them hope and a purpose and a direction and a vision and a mission and a future? Don't you remember? No, we don't remember. They exchanged God's intended blessing for them into suffering for themselves and, catch it, for all the people around them. Because, you know, when you and I make decisions, no one's an island, right? We don't just affect ourselves. We affect everyone around us when we make decisions. They wanted freedom. They wanted a new start in a new place, but they wouldn't trust God enough to move forward on faith because that's what it takes. And they went from bad to worse, from distrust to disbelief to disloyalty to outright defiance. And that, of course, in the end, led them to become disqualified and displaced. Disqualified and displaced. It meant that the people would have to spend another, catch it, 40 years in the desert. Oh, they thought that journey was rough. We'll give it another 40 years. Let's see how you feel after that. Numbers chapter 14, verse 26 through 30. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble and complain against me? I have heard the grumblings of this people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Therefore say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number listed in the census, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. See, God's plan for God's people 
is only realized through those who place their faith and their trust in him and move forward on that faith even when things don't always line up or make sense. Because that's almost always the case with God. See, the very, listen, the very nature of the way that God asks us to respond to him is on the basis of faith. If we could see it all and have it all, and it's all in the pocket and all figured out, and it's a surefire bet, and there's nothing to worry about, then he wouldn't need to do anything, and we wouldn't need faith. Therefore, God asks us to do the impossible so that he would get all the glory when it happens. Fast forward 40 years in the future. As Moses comes to the end of his life, he's dealt with these people forever. He's coming to the end of his life, and he gives the people a message. Now, Moses, by his own admission, was not a good speaker, not a good orator, not a public speaker kind of guy, okay? And he gives one of the most profound messages in his final statements, after getting to know these people for a long time, he watched them turn away from God countless times whenever things weren't going their way. Whenever the future wasn't obvious and everything was clear, and they would just turn away. And so in his farewell speech, he presents them with two options. He stands before the congregation and he says, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically the summation of the speech is this. You can love, you can love God enough, because you all say you love God, but you can love him enough to trust and obey him. Remember what Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You can love God enough to trust and obey him and enjoy a bountiful, rich life, one that will be filled with, yes, challenges, and yes, struggles, but one that will be full of purpose and meaning. A life that is focused on his kingdom. Option number two, you can just keep on doubting God. And let the fear consume you and keep you from fulfilling your purpose, keep you from taking uh, uh, the path that he wants you to take, and instead take the path of ease and comfort and complacency, because after all, that's safe. A mediocre life accomplishing little of eternal, as Dr. Bryan said, eternal significance, because that's all that matters. Because, like, who cares, right? Who cares how well you do and how wonderful your marriage is and how well you're educated and how great you do in your career and how much you save in your 401K and how, how good of a house you have and how great your cars are and how many vacations you take and how well you're respected and how politically well you've done for yourself or any number of other nonsense if you don't do one thing for eternity that makes a difference. Most miserable wretch in the world is a person that has lived the most successful, happy, joyous life, pain-free, and dies and goes to hell. Or a believer that does the same thing and dies and goes to heaven, but no reward. Robbed of the, uh, the option, the possibility, the prospect of doing great things for God. It's a terrible, terrible way to live. Oh, it's safe, yeah. Not have to take any chances, no risk. See, these people had a road ahead of them. God had all these great plans for them. He provided everything for them. He'd grown their numbers and given them everything they need, and they had a road ahead of them. And when it came time for the challenge, they were not up to the challenge. God's last resort at this point I guess all of you have got to die. This entire generation of people here have to die. Everyone 20 years old and up, you got to just die. Because then I can move forward with the people that are left. They had a road ahead of them, and they had choices to make. You know what? You and I every day have a road ahead of us, and we have chances to take and choices to make both as individuals and as a congregation.
Have you ever asked yourself, am I part, am I at the center of what God is doing? Or am I one of those that are fighting against what he's doing? I ask myself that often. It's a sobering question. One final thought. We mentioned that no man is an island. The things you do, the decisions you make, have a drastic effect on everyone else around you. The choices we make profoundly impact those around us, our wives, our children, our congregation. And as we travel the journey on the road ahead of us, Could we please remember that there are other people in the bus too? And when we turn left or turn right or slow down or stop, it affects everyone else that's riding with us. They will experience a portion of the blessing and the pain of whatever decisions we make. It's a sobering thought for me as I consider my life, as I, as I consider how I could live and the things I could and should be doing for the Lord with my life personally. It's sobering for me to consider these things. I hope you'll consider them too. I'll leave you with one last passage. This is from Jesus. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. In other words, that's the gospel, right? Go, go share the gospel. Go be, go be salt and light in your community. Go reach your neighbors with my plan, with my promise. And then, Here's the best part. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, that's the part we forget. That's the part we so easily forget. Because we're people. And whether we're people on the road from the Sinai Peninsula into the Promised Land, or whether we're people on the road from where we are now to where God wants us in the future as individuals, whether we're on the road from where God has brought us as a congregation years ago, or lack thereof, to where we are now, can we recognize what he's done? Can we praise him for what he's done? And can we realize the fact that he's always been with us? What makes us think anything's going to change? The God that rescued us from the past, that brought us into the present, will be the same God that takes us into the future. May we go there in faith. Let's pray. Father, this morning we would ask you, Lord, what what would you have for us? What new territories are you calling us to conquer? Lord, you've brought us through so much as individuals, as a church. What's the next step of faith we need to take on the road ahead? Father, just like centuries ago, your people struggled. We struggle too. And just like your people centuries ago, we too have a road ahead of us. Help us to learn from the lessons of Israel so that we won't repeat those same mistakes. Help us to be faithful to fulfill your purpose for us. Help us to recall all you've brought us through, who we were and who we are now. Help us to remember your amazing faithfulness to us over the years and how you supplied us with everything necessary to move forward in faith. Oh, Lord, as I personally consider your stories and how you've worked through people, Lord, it's humbling to me. It's humbling to consider that you would choose to use me to accomplish your purpose in some small way in this world. And Lord, as individuals, you know each one of our stories. You know what you've called each of us to do. 
Help us to use this opportunity this morning to reaffirm our commitment to you and to move in the direction that you've called each one of us to as individuals. And Lord, this morning as a congregation, would you help us to recommit to you also? To recommit to being salt and light to our community. To recommit to the great commission and great commandment. To press toward our vision of helping neighboring families grow strong through healthy relationships with you and with one another so that you could be glorified. Lord, we confess, <laughs> moving forward in faith is never easy. And you don't give us all the answers on the road ahead, but Lord, we know that you have the answers and we know that you're already there. So we ask you to guide us, to give us the courage, the faith, the resolve to follow you no matter where you lead trusting that you'll provide everything we need to fulfill your purpose for us, for your glory on the road ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.